Welcome back to our final and fourth episode. If you've been with us through this journey, you probably are at a point where you are really looking for extra support uh, for your son who has autism spectrum disorder. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about exploring therapeutic support options and when to consider residential treatment. Uh, We're going to dive into various therapeutic approaches for teenage boys with ASD, including when and how like I said, to consider residential treatment, which is a big step for parents if you're at that point and listening. My name's Tiffany Herlin. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm excited again. The last time we're going to be talking with Chris Brown, who's a licensed marriage family therapist from a residential treatment program for teenage boys called Discovery Ranch. Please remember that this podcast is not a replacement for therapy. Please always seek a mental health professional for your situation. So Chris, I was asking you before we started, is there a specific type of training that a therapist should be receiving or parents should be looking for when they're interviewing a therapist for their son Mm -hmm. and needing that extra support? Um, Is there a type of credential or um, certification? There currently, um, from what I know, um, especially in this field, um, like for me, I, I spent about five years working at a program that was specifically designed for ASD boys and getting and, and they were very heavy into the neurology and understanding the the brain chemistry understanding these kids in a very kind of a molecular way but also in a very kind of humanistic way understanding kind of what makes them who and how to do it and we did a lot of training and research in those areas so I got a lot of my training with my feet on the ground and kind of the the boots on the ground kind of mentality. So experience wise, you you really had to dive into that. Yeah. There is some, I I think it's called ABA training. um, Yeah, I have heard that. Applied behavioral, you can take those classes and and become also an expert into working with that um, as well. So there are, there's two ways to kind of get into that, that, those fields. Um, for me, it's more of the, the boots on the ground and just being able to, to kind of delve into the research and kind of understand the kids. And then for through, through that trial and error and being able to work with other clinicians that are specialized or, or that do specialize in neurodiversity and in autism and stuff like that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's helpful for our, our listeners. And I, I'm also aware that like there's not as necessarily a certification yes that you're going to be wanting to ask the therapist do they yeah. have it's more do they have the experience do mm-hmm. have they dived into the research have they spent the time studying this yeah. specific topic um, if you're talking to a therapist and say oh yeah i've met with a few yeah know that they may just not have the breadth and knowledge that they need to address your your son or daughter's needs exactly so you really want to look for that experience in a therapist and exactly. someone who really is passionate about this yes because not every therapist is yeah um so yeah yeah. so it's just like it's it's like we all get like i'm a marriage and family therapist you're a licensed clinical social worker we all have this degree but then we also specialize in certain areas and so some some therapists specialize in substance abuse or uh, addiction or um, adoption adoptions or couples and stuff like that and for me i just uh, my specialty and my passion is with ASD boys, teenage boys in a residential setting. Yeah. Okay. I think that's good for parents to know. What are some warning signs that, or red flags, I guess, that parents should look for that indicate their son may need additional mental health support? Um, and this is a good one because I, I have had hundreds of kids come through my doors, hundreds of kids that have come through different facilities that I've worked at, and and it's usually pretty much violence. So if the if the student has actually reached that point where they're actually bigger and they're more violent and aggressive and they're actually pushing their mom or, or going after their dad or using knives, um, threatening siblings with that, that's probably a sign that you you need to start looking at at a home placement. Um, If they're threatening their own lives, if it's constantly calling the police and saying, hey, my son and daughter is struggling with, they're they're threatening their own lives, they're threatening me, I can't sleep at night, I'm locking the door every single night, Um, I'm trying to protect my valuables, I'm trying to protect me. Um, I have one boy that came in, um, and this was at another facility, where he actually went after one of his younger siblings, and they actually had, the mom had to barricade herself in the room and hold the door while he was trying to get after this little sibling. And she was very young, like three or four years old. Oh. And to hurt her, 
And so at that point, the mom knew, hey, I've got to work with the school district. I've got to get this young man out of my home into a safe environment where they can actually work with him and I can do that. So the violence is, is huge. The, um, the suicidality, the self-harming stuff, if it's getting to that point, the running away, um, also getting into drugs and alcohol as well. Yeah. Um, getting into um, things that the heat probably shouldn't be getting into. We had one boy uh, steal a car and drive one. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, he, and he was underage by quite a bit. Yeah. So they be, start to become ungovernable. Yeah. Meaning that they're, they're just, they're, they're loose and they're, they're, the police are being called and it's just, they've been referred to uh, juvenile justice a lot or DCFS a lot or anything like that. It's time to start looking at, at a home placement. Yeah. At the one program I worked at, parents would have to step in and intervene before uh, the law did yes because the law doesn't understand uh, I think they're getting better I, I shouldn't speak for every place and yeah. state but a lot of places don't understand kids on the spectrum and mm-hmm. the law the, is the law and there's not a lot of wiggle yeah. room around it and if you've done a beer and C and broke the law it doesn't matter if you're on the spectrum or not yeah and had ill intent or planned you know yeah. planned it out or just impulsive but like that's what they don't care about that yeah so parents stepping in front and um, getting ahead of that yeah it's going to be huge yeah. because you don't want your kid in the legal system who's on the spectrum. Yeah. It's not going to help them. No. And if you have a judge that is looking at a 17-year-old or 16-year-old yeah. young man that's on the spectrum, but mentally he's six, seven, eight years old, mentally, then, but he's going to look at him, at him, look at him as a 16, 17-year-old that is breaking the law yep. as opposed to a six, seven, eight-year-old mental young man. Yeah. Unfortunately, so they don't look at him as anything other than neurotypical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even though they're not. Yeah. Uh, And I think other things to point out too is that you've exhausted your options. You've done outpatient therapy. You've involved support network in the school Mm -hmm. and special education and, and your child isn't getting better. Yes. They're digressing. Yeah. And like you said, you're just in constant crisis. Yeah. And exhausted and burnt out and just it's, it's above... And you're scared for your own family. You're scared for your own life. You're scared for the people around you. It's just, it's like you said, exhausting. And it's it's time to to take the next step. Yeah. So parents, if you're listening and you're at that place, then Uh this is a podcast. This is the episode for you. Yes. If you're not, thank goodness. Yes. We don't really want our parents to get this point. Mm -hmm. I've worked in residential for years and I wish it wasn't a thing. Yes. I wish it wasn't needed, but it is. and, And thank goodness it is for families who do need it. Yes. Um, so there are options and there is hope if you're at that point. Yes. Can medication be an effective treatment option for teenage boys with ASD? And if so, what are the benefits and risks? So for me, medication is paramount. Um, it is one of the four legs of the table that I use to, to help uh, an ASD student succeed. So the four legs are clinical. Um, and that is my job. As the clinician, I am in charge of making sure that all everyone's on the same page, so academic, residential, and the doctor um, or, or the medical side. So, And then the next one is academics, so making sure that the academic team knows um, how, to, how to work with this young man, how to support him in his struggles or in his success at school. And then the residential team and understanding how to help him through a flood, help him through any type of um, struggles or successes. Behaviors, day-to-day things. Exactly. And then the very last one is that medical piece. That medical piece is so paramount in helping because I, I've talked a little bit about that bandwidth of functionality that they have, that where they're cognitive, where they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. And medication can increase that bandwidth where they're actually much more relaxed, much more capable of staying cognitive. I mean, I've had kids where we've got him on a certain medication and it, it's night and day. All of a sudden he is calm and relaxed and he is now listening to me. He's able to, to, to process the information I'm giving him. He's able to use those skills. He's able to go to school. He's able to function just from a medic, medical standpoint. And we've actually had kids that do uh, neuropsych test after and the neuropsych um, psychologist actually says he is he needs to stay on these meds because they are the ones that are helping him stay in that functional 
uh, atmosphere or that functional environment where he can be productive. And possibly when he becomes 18, 19, and 20, when his brain starts to settle down, that's when you can probably start to wean him off of it. But right now in his teenage years, he needs those medications to, to, to be able to access those skills that we're talking about, to be able to understand um, the processes. Because without those medications, he would... He would, he would struggle. He'd fall back into some old patterns of behavior and then lose it. And then we'd lose him again, which was scary. No, that makes a lot of sense to be, look at, you know, really them as a whole and the whole environment that's affecting them. Mm -hmm. Not only just their mental and academic, but also their, you know, physical as well and how Mm -hmm. the medications affect that. I think it's important to note too, that sometimes they can be on the wrong meds and over medicated when they come in. And so it's not just getting them on meds, it's getting them on the right medication and the right dosage. We don't want them to be over medicated. Yeah. We want them to be able to function. Yes. And I've seen kids come in completely over medicated. Mm Mm-hmm. So. And I, I mean, I, I tell the doctor, I, I, I can work with a, a calm kid, maybe, and, and, and I don't want them over medicated as well, but yeah. I can work with a kid that's a little bit calmer, a little bit more, and we can actually move the medication to a point where he is out of kind of a, a, a very normal kind of um, mentality. I can't work with a, a, and I call it a Tasmanian devil, someone who is just so energetic, so spinning, so reactive, struggling with transitions, struggling with anything. I can't, I I can't, I I struggle to work with that because it's just now it's reactionary. We're just reacting to the kid and we're just trying to keep him safe as he's bouncing. It's all behavioral at that point and you're not getting to the solution and the real root of the problem. Yeah. So I can work with a very calm and kid down here as we're trying to move him into a successful um, kind of medicated spot as opposed to a uh, kind of a reactionary kid that is not medicated or not successful up here. It's, and then of course, when they're not medicated and they're struggling, then, um, they have failure after failure after failure. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to teach them all these skills and they're, it's not clicking because they're like, Chris, I'm doing everything that you're asking me. I'm doing everything in academics and residential and everything, but I'm still failing at everything. So we really need to get that doc, uh, the, the psychiatrist and the medical side on board so that they can be supportive of that. I mean, is it fair to say that, you know, we want to get them out of chemical imbalance Yes. And their brain firing correctly because mm-hmm. they do have what we, you know, their brain is wired differently. Yes. So we want them to be um, releasing the correct uh, hormones and yeah. no, uh, neurotransmitters is what yes. I was looking for. So yeah. that they can function in that executive functioning. They can learn yes. those skills. They can develop yeah. their brain and create new neural pathways. Yes. Am I saying that all correctly? You're, you're saying that correctly. Okay. And the, it's very interesting because I went to the autism symposium in New Hampshire just recently, and I loved it. We actually had that. a, it's a great um, symposium. We had a doctor come in and actually do the the keynote speak with speech with us, and and she's from Dartmouth, and I believe her, she's Dr. Davison or something, um, and she actually has done brand new research on the autistic mind, and she actually found that there's a, a neurotransmitter in our brain called glutamate, mm-hmm. and glutamate is the excitatory transmitter it it creates excite excitement in us it, it creates this elation us it it creates excitement in all all human beings and so what she found was that in ASD students that is the same it's very normal doses as a, opposed to neurotypicals mm-hmm. so that's the same but there's this, also this neurotransmitter called GABA and it's the one that kind of calms those neurotransmitters mm-hmm. down and what she found was, I, I, I believe it was like 35% less GABA within those neurotransmitters or those in ASD students as opposed to neurotypicals. Interesting. So when, when ASD students start to ramp up, they can't ramp down. So that's why we see these so their kids. their brain's not firing correctly to it, get them to calm down. Exactly. Makes sense. And so I, I've encouraged my parents, because you can buy GABA, um, and, and our nurse and our doctor is really good at saying, yeah, if they want to buy that over-the-counter GABA supplements from Amazon or whatever, yeah, let's give it to them and see Try if they, th- yeah. that will help them out. Um, so that's a, another piece that we're looking at, but also that medical medication piece 
um, of helping with those antipsychotics or those other types of medications to help calm them down when they do get excited because they will get excited they will kind of start to ramp up and they need help coming back down okay that's really good to know let's take a step back and so you're a parent you've tried everything you exhausted resources mm-hmm. maybe even medication at that point yeah. and you need to find a residential treatment center. Yes. So let's talk about, I think a lot of our parents may not be aware, but there are educational consultants. What are they and how can they help? So usually they'll, they'll provide some options for you. So maybe it's three options of these are the placements that would, would probably accept your son or daughter. And they, they will help you get in contact with those, those the admissions team. They would help contact um, the therapist. They would get everything set up so that they are, they're part of the journey to be able to help support and then they would also stay with you if you'd want them to to stay with you during the time that your your son or daughter is in residential or in a therapeutic boarding school to be able to be a support to you because at times and advocate for you exactly advocate be able to say hey are you having a hard time with this are you having something with this I'll reach out as well and start that process of, of maybe getting a dietary plan or getting something in the academics or something um, but they're they're very supportive and they're very helpful to, to the whole process of getting your son or daughter help. That, that and they're they great at, you know, when you're ready for the next step or the coming home yes. and the transition, helping you there. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're a valuable resource. Um, they are worth your time and money, uh, yes. you know, to use. Oh, yeah. Because uh, usually parents who co- are at the point of looking at residential, you're mm-hmm. exhausted, you're burnt out, you're in crisis, yeah. you're in fight, flight, or freeze mode all the mm-hmm. time. And you're probably not thinking very clearly and to have to go on and, just even Google a placement for your son or daughter, you're going to find hundreds Yes, and who knows if they're good or not. Yeah. And what they look like on the website may not be what they look like. You know, they really are in person and Mm -hmm. then you got to tour them. And and so this person helps you take out all that stress. Exactly. And they're that support team to help walk you through it while you're just feeling overwhelmed and you need that extra support. Yeah. And I just got it. I mean, I I got probably about two hours ago, I got a text from our admissions team over at, uh, Discovery Ranch saying, hey, a new boy is coming in. Uh, here is the ed consult. Here is or the education consultant. Um, here is the family. They're coming in on this day and this uh, this time. And so it's it's great to have that because I know that they've been prepped. They This is the placement because a lot of times parents will reach out to us without an education consultant and then they and might... And that's okay. That's okay. And it might... It, it might we might go down this path of maybe a few weeks of trying to figure out if this boy is is appropriate for us and we might not we f- might find out at the very end of this journey that no and then the parent has to start over yeah and the start over with an education consultant they would have a, a, a list of, of just a bunch of different places and then they would send emails out and then we'd all collab they do a lot of the hard work for the parents yes they do so if you're at this place they are worth looking into yes and considering um if you have the you know resources and the avail you know availability for that then Mm -hmm. then it's something you you'd want to consider and we want our parents and listeners to know that that's an option yes definitely um what are the benefits of residential treatment programs so there there is a, a a plentiful uh, benefits to, to coming to a residential treatment center. First of all, you get the expertise. Um, there's a lot of expertise. There's a lot of professionals that are working together. So it's 24 hours, seven days a week, um, eyes on your boy. Um, especially at it's a whole team. It's a whole team. It's not just two parents trying to manage it alone. You get a whole team. So it's hundreds of people. Yeah. So there's not, there's less burnout. Yeah. there's, There's less exhaustion. Exactly. So we've got we got residential staff. Yep. About a, so like at the bunkhouse, we got four per shift, and we got one, two, three, four shifts. So on Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday shift, and then a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then some Sunday shifts. So we got about maybe sixty staff that are working with your your son. We've got a whole. Uh, clinical team that is working with your son so me and a bunch of other therapists a clinical director and then a bunch of other people we've got a medical team that is working with your son we've got the academic team that's working with your son so there's a whole bunch of people that so and then we got the horse guy we've got the rec therapist we've got just a whole bunch of different people that are are all interacting with your son all being supportive of him all being able to actually go home at the end of the day regroup decompress and then come back and work with your son again and 
go through all the struggles and stuff like that while you are working on yourself. So it gives you a break. Mm -hmm. It puts your son in a safe environment. Yes. So you no longer have to manage and worry about their safety and your safety. Yes. Um, You've got a whole treatment team support. Yeah. And more than one person trying to figure this out and looking at those four legs of the table like you were talking about. Yeah. I, I mean, if you're at the point where you need this, you've got this wonderful supportive team to kind of carry some of the burdens that you've been doing alone and to help find solutions Mm -hmm. and healing for your son's mental health journey and your own. Yeah. Yeah. And everything that we do over at Discovery Ranch is programmatic and therapeutic. Even though we we try and couch it at times as you're going to ride a horse and you're going to do this, but there is a a programmatic and kind of an experiential activity associated with that. We're going to go rock climb or we're going to go do all these ground tasks at rec therapy. And there is a programmatic and they're learning from every one of these, like even the hike, even though it's fun and we go, we get to go do all these fun things on the hike. It's programmatic. It's experiential. Uh, One thing that we know, especially with ASD boys and girls is that um, talk therapy is not that productive with them. I've had so many students come through my door and talk to me and I think I've just changed the world. I think I've made <laughs> it. It's amazing therapy. I've had those moments yes. where I'm like, I'm amazing. Yeah. I, go I out change out there this kid. and yeah. change the world and then he'll go out and all of a sudden I hear screaming, <laughs> yeah. yelling and he is he's Didn't being Didn't process what you said. Yeah, he did not and and I'm like, I thought I thought we did this. He's like, I forgot what you said. <laughs> so talk therapy at times doesn't work that yeah. well with ASD students. And so my job is to actually do the talk therapy, do the family therapy, but then also I do a bunch of experiential groups. But then also I'm talking to all your all the people working for you. So the residential side, I'm, I'm teaching them how to work with you. I'm talking to the academic team on how to the work with this student. I'm talking to the doctor and to the nurse on how to work with this student. So my job is really kind of important in that I and the... The, the person that is just making sure that everyone's on the same page with this student. So it's, it's, but yeah, but talk therapy is important and it's not as important as neurotypicals because it's not, yeah, I wish it was more important, but so it's important, but it's not, but it, it's going to, the, the, the work that I do around him and the scaffolding I do around him is going to be paramount with him. Well, for a neurodiverse student, mm-hmm. um, they need more concrete, hands-on experiences. Yeah, they need the five senses being activated yep. and sit there and talk therapy is not. And it's going to allow them to dive deeper and gain more mm-hmm. insight and to make those connections in their brain and create neuro, new neuropathways yes. um, that they wouldn't be able to get just through talking. Exactly. Uh, you know, they. I think a neurotypical student, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, we have not I've learned in trainings that it's like a neurotypical student only has to touch the stove once, twice mm-hmm. to realize they're going to get burned. A neurodiverse uh, student may have to do it 50 times mm-hmm. before it really registers yeah. and they've been able to realize, oh, when I do this, this happens. So therapy takes a little bit longer mm-hmm. and you need more than talk. Yeah. You can't just talk them through it. Yeah. And you need those experiences, um, which Discovery Ranch is incredible for. I think... That answers some of my question, but I'm still going to ask it. Like, why should a parent choose Discovery Ranch over a program for their son who struggles with ASD? Yeah, so so we we definitely have that that expertise. The staff are all trained up in it. The academic team is all trained up in it. The the doctor actually, and our doctor that we currently have is an ASD um, specialized in it as well. So he does he does everything. Uh, the whole ranch, but he has a specialty with working with ASD students mm-hmm. as well. So he knows the medications that work really well with him. Um, but then we also have that experiential stuff. So we have the equine, we have the hikes, we have the outdoor activities, we have the calf the rec program. therapy. The calf program is huge. Which real quick, I'm just mm-hmm. going to say, if you're interested in hearing more about that, we have mm-hmm. in a previous um, season before this episodes, you can find out more Mm-hmm. about the CAF program and other things that are offered that we've interviewed uh, other people from your team yeah. about it. So Yes. And equine as well. Yeah, so a lot of different experiential stuff. And we, we're really working on, and, and it's, it's great because Discovery Ranch is really good at saying, Chris, we understand that your boys are going to be a little bit different than, than the neurotypical boys and the neurotypical houses. So your 
um, the way that you process, the way that you interact with the students, the way that you, um, and I don't like to call it consequence them, but the way that you, you help them learn from their mistakes um, is going to be different. And so we have a whole different program built into the, into the bunkhouse, into the Discovery Ranch for the, the ASD students that is specifically designed to support their neurology, to support their, because like you were saying, they've got some very deep grooves on, on the, in their neurology on how they behave. And we have to go against the grain. We have to go against that. Mm -hmm. And it takes time actually, because they are, they've come to us after 14, 15, 16 years of doing it their way and having these very deep grooves in their brain. And we are, we're fighting against it. It was not going to happen in a month to rewrite that yes and we're also uh, another thing that i really like about discovery ranch that I, I haven't seen at other programs is that we are designed and built to handle tough kids sometimes these kids come in pretty set in their ways they don't like transitions they don't like stress i call that rock brain yes oh yeah <laughs> they are they're they don't want to move yep. they don't want to do things and our staff are trained to be supportive of them and then if there is a safety issue, our staff are trained to help in that safety. So if a student is unsafe, if a student is trying to hurt another student or themselves or staff, our staff are trained to be supportive of that student and to support that student in a way that helps them get back into a cognitive state. Um, a lot of programs out there, if a student gets violent or aggressive or suicidal, they're like, we can't, we can't support this kid, he needs to go somewhere else. And eventually they probably end up with us. And then all of a sudden that student, I've got a student that has been in 11 different programs. Oh, wow. And he has blown out of 11 different programs and finally has come to us and he's been with us for six months and his poor mother is like, Chris, are you gonna kick him out? And I'm like, no, this is what we do every single day. She probably has so much PTSD from that. Yeah, so she is, she's, she's, and I'm like, no, this is, this is normal. This is what we deal with. Yeah. And he's getting better. He's starting to trust more. He's starting to be more uh, open to suggestion and to be influenced better. So, and our whole program is we don't, we can't control. If you're out of control, then we have to help you. We have to, if you're running, uh, if you're violent, if you're aggressive, we have to be able to support you and to keep you safe. But if, if you are doing what you need to do, we're going to influence you, hopefully for the best. Um, and you're going to make that, the, the student is going to make a choice. I'm going to go down this path or this path, and um, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. But it's, it's all about helping that student grow. So what can a parent expect if they place at D Discovery Ranch? What can they expect for treatment to look like for their son with ASD? So for the, for usually for the, and, and a lot of parents want to jump in almost immediately into insight and to talking about the trauma and talking about like the past and stuff like that. And I have to really kind of say, first of all, let's work on, you guys get some help on your side. Go get your own therapy. Get your own therapy, <laughs> get your help and stuff like that. But for the first maybe six months, we have to get that limbic system under control. Mm. He's got to learn those skills to become cognitive. Regulate the nervous system. Yeah. So, and I have a, a, so if he is able to eventually get to the point where when he is frustrated or stressed, he goes cognitive instead of limbic 80% of the time. So he's having a stressful moment at equine. And instead of getting off the horse and throwing a fit and screaming and yelling and going limbic, he goes cognitive and says, okay, well, I, oh, I just need to take a break. I need to relax. And that happens. I'm frustrated. Yeah. That's frustrated. I'm upset, but I'm going to. Labeling the emotion. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Get through it. If he can do that 80% of the time, that means we, he is at a point where we can actually start that insight work. Yes. So that's kind of my, my gauge right there of knowing when we can start maybe talking more about the trauma. So a lot of the very first three to six months is mostly based on skill development and being able to stay in a, in a place where they are cognitive instead of limbic. And that's huge. And then once we go there, then a lot of the work really kind of starts. A lot of the, the being able to apologize, be able to talk to their parents, be able to open up um, and to be much more cognizant of what they've done. Maybe even more empathetic to yes. how their behaviors have affected their parents and siblings. Yeah. yeah, I kind of relate this to, you know, having a two-year-old throwing a tantrum. It's like, if you're in the middle of a two-year-old 
classic wanting a sucker or a cookie at the grocery store if uh-huh. you're like, oh, no, we're going to have dinner and, and the, they're throwing a tantrum and on yeah. the floor and screaming. You're not going to be able to talk them through that because mm-hmm. they're in their limbic yeah. system, you know, and, and there's no point. So the goal is as a parent to not have this adult conversation of inside of yes. like, no, there's dinner in an hour. They yes. don't care. No, they, they don't. want the sucker, you know, yeah. and, and they're raging. And so it's getting them grounded, helping them calm down, doing the breathing, mm-hmm. holding them, getting them through whatever Hulk moment they're in. Yes. And then once they get grounded and regulated, you can have a yeah. little better conversation with them, right? Of exactly. here's why and here's how you can get it, you know. But helping parents see, I mean, most kids are like that and mm-hmm. especially kids who are on the spectrum yeah. are gonna be more like that. Yeah. And even into their teenagers. Yeah, so. especially the ones that come through the, our doors that are already limbic dominant, yeah. meaning that they live in their limbic system all the time and that they are just, they're struggling and we just need to get them cognitive. Yeah, that makes tons of sense. How do staff work with the students residentially uh, who are on the spectrum? So I have a, a two-month program that I work with the, the staff. And so every week on Wednesday, I have a, a, a half an hour meeting with all the staff that want to come in. And it's usually kind of a required course. And, and it actually goes over understanding the limbic system, understanding the cognitive system, understanding how to be supportive of these students. But also it has a do's and don'ts with these students. It has a skills module training on how to support their neurology. Um, but the main thing that um, I am trying to emphasize with the, the staff is that they have to be a trusting partner with them. That is huge because when when a student is limbic and sees you as an enemy, it's going to create a much more limbic dominant mindset as opposed to someone. So if I walk in and they trust me and they're limbic, they're going to see me as a a trusted person that can help them come out of that limbic dominant mind. So I can sit there and, and, and be supportive and helpful and they're going to feel safe with me as opposed to unsafe. So a staff can do that by getting to know them, understanding them, um, getting to know their, their strengths and their weaknesses, getting to know what works for them and what doesn't work for them, getting to know what skills that they're working on and what, doesn't, what they're not working on, getting to know their flood plan, um, getting to know what, uh, what, is, what is helpful. Um, and that all is, is designed to develop trust. Mm. And so that trust is huge with the staff um, because there are times when, when a student is out of control and they're struggling so bad and then that favorite staff walks in and then they just like, oh, I'm glad you're here because I, I trust you. Help me, help me. Because that's, that's all that they're doing really is when they're limbic, it's more of a, a cry for help and just saying, hey, I, am I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe. I'm so out of control yeah. that I, I need you to help me put, back, put me back into safety. So please help me. And, and maybe your presence can help. Maybe some of the things that you know about me can put me help me. So trust is huge, but then also all the skills that the do's and don'ts, the, the skills module, the understanding of the neurology is going to be very important for these staff. Having worked at a residential treatment program, uh, especially with kids who are on the spectrum, this is huge, the, the work that you're doing with the staff. Because yes. as a therapist, you can have all the training and skills and knowledge, yeah. but you're not with the kid 24-7. Exactly. You're with them um, a couple times a week, you mm-hmm. know, in therapy and groups and things like that. Yeah. But to really translate those skills down to the staff who are with them mm-hmm. on the floor, in the trenches, yeah. um, that's going to be the most powerful change you're going to see is when they're in their day-to-day living yeah. and practicing what you're teaching in therapy and then having the support network that they need through the staff yeah. to help coach them through that. And that's just incredible work, honestly, Yeah, from my perspective that you're doing is, is getting, I think that was the hardest part as a therapist working at, you know, at the programs I have is, is getting the staff on board yeah. and understanding and how to help a student in the crisis and when they flip to that kind of Hulk yeah. Tasmanian devil or limbic system, yes. how to help them get regulated again. Yeah. Cause I, I, I want to go to work and, and enjoy my time. Yeah. I want to go to work and feel like I'm, we're a team. And so I do I a lot it. of work behind the scenes to really kind of get everyone on the same page. And then once we're all on the same page, my job is a little bit better the staff's job's a little bit better. The academic team is a little bit better. The residential, everyone is just, it's, we're just, we're humming along and it's just better. And I can actually go home 
and enjoy the time that I'm home instead of worrying that things are going to go crazy or, or this shift is not the best. But but if I train them all up, that's amazing. Yeah, they're all on the same page and they're all humming along perfectly. You're probably getting less crisis calls and text messages, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Um, I think this answers the question alone of what makes you guys unique in helping mm-hmm. kids on the spectrum. Like the fact that you're doing that with the staff is just yeah. really I don't know if revolutionary is it because everyone should be doing it. Yes. <laughs> Every yeah. program that takes ASD kids should be doing that. Yes. But I, you're just a step ahead. Yeah. Honestly doing that. That's incredible. I like it. I like it. Um, so helping the staff, empowering them, giving them the skills that therefore help the kids with their day-to-day living. Mm-hmm. It's going to be huge. Yeah. Um, you also do neurofeedback. Yes. Talk to us a little bit about that. So so neurofeedback is, is kind of long along the same lines as biofeedback. So what happens is there's a frequency within the brain, it's 12 to 15 hertz, that's the magic zone. It's the the sweet spot of frequency during the daytime. So when we're focused, when we are um, we're patient when we are at our, our peak performance, we're at 12 to 15 hertz. Okay. So if we're too high in our frequency, that means we're in crisis mode. So we're in this more Tasmanian devil. We're kind of spinning and, and, and just struggling. If we're too low in our frequency, and, and the frequencies go from zero to 100, if we're too low, then that's the sedation. That's where we should be when we're trying to sleep or anything like that. Um, and so neurofeedback actually pushes against the brain and actually helps the brain regulate at 12 to 15 hertz. So a lot of our students are either too high or too low when they first come in. And so how, how it, what it looks like is, and, and we do this, I, I, have, I think we have about uh, 20 kids on doing neurofeedback right now. And I have a technician I've, uh, we've hired that, and she comes in every single day, hooks the kids up to the neurofeedback machine and it's kind of like a heart monitor, but right. Um, it's much more intense than that. Yeah. It's much more intense. So what happens? Just to help the, our listeners understand. Yeah. Uh huh. So how it works, and there's a def, definitely a, a bunch of different companies out there that do do neurofeedback. Some do auditory. Okay. Others do the the finger and the the heart rate. This one is very visual, and so we want to encourage the brain to hit that those frequencies, and the and the way that we do it is through the visual uh, media. And so what happens is the student will come in and sit down in front of a television set. And then there's a computer that runs the neurofeedback software. And it's all, and what, sh- what uh, the technician will do is we'll hook up some electrodes to the brain. And wow. so certain electrodes are, are hooked to the brain to just read the information from the brain. So it's reading the frequencies of the brain. Because um, I've done a different one yes. uh, personally that uh-huh. uh, when I went to a conference. So that sounds a lot more high tech. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so, keep going. So, I'm excited. I keep yeah. going. <laughs> so what happens is, so the, the technician will say, okay, computer, or, or tell the computer, I want this, I want to encourage the brain to be at 12, 12 hertz. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what happens is the student will sit down there. The, compu- the, the, the computer is reading the frequency of the brain. And let's say the, the brain is saying eight hertz. It's too low right now. So they're watch- they can watch a Netflix movie. They can watch anything on YouTube. They can watch a DVD. Those are the subscriptions that we have currently right now. And so what happens is they're watching it and they're at the low frequency or the high frequency or not hitting that 12 hertz. The screen will actually get very small. So it'll, it'll be very kind of grainy at times. It might have holes in it. It might, so like this big TV right here that we have, the, everything is very small and the sound might be off. And so it's, it's in, so the, the student is sitting there like, what? this is dumb. I, I don't want to watch, let's say they're watching uh, The Flash. That's, that's really popular right now. Okay. They're watching The Flash and they're like, I hate this. Um, but one thing that we know about the brain is the brain is really good at talking about itself. So behind the scenes, not in this conscious area, but behind the scenes, the brain is talking about itself, trying to figure out what's going on. The brain is really good at monitoring our heart rate. It's monitoring our digestion. Mm-hmm. It's monitoring uh, circulatory. It's, it's doing everything behind the scenes. So subconsciously or unconsciously, the brain is trying to say, okay, what's going on here? And the, and the student can't do anything about it. So sometimes they'll squint or they'll just like, like look at it really funny and try and force the screen to get big. So as the brain starts to cycle and trying to figure out what's going on, it'll hit that 12 hertz, the one that the computer says. And all of a sudden the screen will get very big. 
It'll get very bright. They'll be able to watch it. And then all of a sudden the student's like, oh my gosh, I was, and then, and then all of a sudden they'll hit another frequency and it gets very small. And so there's this back and forth going on as the brain is trying to figure out what is going on. And then all of a sudden the brain will figure it out. And it takes maybe a good half an hour for these students. Young people can figure it out a lot faster than I can. It might take me two sessions, maybe two, three hours to figure it out, but they can figure it out within a half an hour. And all of a sudden the brain figures out 12 hertz is the, the magic number. And if I hit that thing, the screen gets big and all of a sudden it figures it out. And so all of a sudden the screen will get big and then they'll be able to watch it for the rest of the 45 minutes or 30 minutes. And then everything, so, and after that session, because that's the frequency we, we want to be in, the 12 to 15 hertz, which is that, that sweet spot of functionality. And they, the, so, so the technician will say, hey, how do you feel after this? And usually the student will say, I feel good, I feel relaxed, I feel focused, I feel, the, a lot of the students will say zen-like, I feel very zen-like. Um, and then they'll leave and it might, might last maybe an hour or two after, and then they go back to their thing. But every single, single time that they come in, it lasts longer and longer and longer. So every well, time- Because you're rewiring the brain, right? Yeah, you are forced, yeah you're, yeah, you're you're pushing back against the brain and saying, hey, if you want to enjoy this TV show that you like, because it's rewarding to you to like it and it's rewarding to you to, to watch the, the, the show, you have to hit that frequency. So the brain mm -hmm. figures out very quickly, uh, if I want to enjoy the show, which I like, I have to hit that frequency every single time. And it's like riding a bike or exercising or you just get better and better every single time. And after the 20 sessions, you are able to, normally you're able to, to, to keep that going for a long time. Our students might need 40 sessions. They might need 60 sessions because they are, they're struggling. But for, the most pe for most people out in the community, it's 20 sessions. For our boys, it might be 40 sessions or 60 sessions. But they're able to maintain that without side effects, without, um, with, and it's, it's long lasting too. It's, it, That's incredible. It lasts for a very long time because the brain likes it. It uses less resources. And we know that the brain is, the, is so hungry for resources. And if you're too high or too low, you're using too many resources. If you're right at that sweet spot, you're using just the right amount of resources to function. And it's, it's great. I've heard a lot of great things about neurofeedback. Uh -huh. um, I haven't personally, as a therapist, been trained in it. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, there's research out there on yes. it. And it's just really powerful. Yeah. And proven to really, really help people. Yeah. And I've been, I've been trained in this for, for the last 10 years. And so That's I've awesome. actually had hundreds of people come through. I've actually done a lot of it with students. Um, and we actually started um, at maybe every single facility I've gone to, we've actually kept it going. I've, I've encouraged it and Love stuff it. like that. It's hard to get going in a program yes. and then to have someone keep it up yes. because it, like you said, it's not, it's very, there's a lot of equipment, time intensive, mm -hmm. yeah. there's a lot behind it. So yes. a lot of programs don't do neurofeedback yeah. because of that. And when in reality, every program should be doing it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we go through the Othmers, which are in Woodland Hills, California. So it's eeginfo.com. And that's their website where if you want to learn anything about neurofeedback, you want to see the research on neurofeedback, how they, how they work and stuff like that. So we actually go and get trained there and we get our certification there. We get all, all of our equipment from them. And then we, we, do that at, at Discovery Ranch. So a lot of parents, when they first come in, they'll actually say, hey, I want to start up on neurofeedback. And we actually have found that parents who start doing neurofeedback at the very start tend to um, have better results. That's awesome. Yeah. I think it's important to know, as you said, these kids may need 40 sessions for versus 20. Mm -hmm. I think parents need to have some front loading of therapy does take a bit longer for kids on the spectrum. Yes. Um, especially residential, um, you know, like you said, they've had years and years and years of their brain being wired a certain way. Mm -hmm. It's not just going to be fixed in a couple months. Yes. And, and they tend, their brain fights you a little more yes. <laughs> than a neurotypical brain. Yes. So where some kids, they may only need eight to 10 months of treatment. Mm -hmm. Some ASD kids may need 
18, what would you see? 18, 18 to two years. 18 to two years, which yeah. is what I've seen as well. Mm-hmm. So parents coming in, if you're at this point where you're like, I need residential, yeah. um, know that it can take up to two years yeah. of residential to um, really help. But that yeah. being said, let's help us end on a success story. What yeah. finding um, for our listeners, parents finding hope and knowing that there's light at the end of that, that was 18 to two years, yes. you know? So I, I've had, when I first started working over at Discovery Ranch, uh, on my very first day, um, so when we were coming over for Discovery Academy to Discovery Ranch, I brought over four of my ASD boys over to the ranch. And on the same day, they actually admitted a new ASD student. And he was, he was he's fantastic. I, I love this kid. He, but he came in very dysregulated. He came in blowing out of school after school after school. He came in um, aggressive and just struggling with his anxiety and struggling with he and and uh, the the minute I, I talk a little bit about him, I, I think the if the parents watch this, they'll know who it is. But he came in um, just struggling, and it was we worked so hard with this kid because he was so wonderful. I mean, great personality. But when he went limbic, he went limbic. Mm-hmm. Um, but through our trust, through our working with him, through not giving up on him, through getting him the correct medication, through working with the parents, through all the hardness. Because, I mean, he was a tough kid to work with. After about, I would say, six months, it just started clicking for this kid. And it, that's what I usually see is usually six to nine months of really kind of just in the trenches working with these kids. It happens. All of a sudden, they just start to like go, okay, I, I'm going to trust you guys, and I'm going to work with you guys. And the medication is starting to click, and the residential is starting to click, and everyone's starting to click. It just flipped on this kid, and he has become an amazing young man. I mean, he is pleasant. I mean, he's still himself. He's still quirky and still awkward. Still on the spectrum. Still on the spectrum. He's <laughs> never going to be off the spectrum. But he is a fun kid, talkative, enjoyable, talk your ear off. Um, but that was one of them. And then another student, another uh, kind of a, uh, another student came in probably a, a few months after him. And he was the same way, struggling. But they, they, at the start, these two boys really hated each other. But they became close friends. And I, I remember the day when we were trying to get medication for this, this second student to... to um, and I remember, and it, it still, it's, it's powerful to me because I, I remember... My boss and um, my clinical director sent me a text and saying, hey, we're ready to pull the plug on this. We're ready to send this kid off. And I said, just give it a little bit more time. Medication's going to hit pretty soon. I'm sorry. No, um, it's but okay. it's, it's uh, But we just, and literally within like th- a week after that, the medication finally hit. It clicked, and it was just, this kid made a complete 180, and he was, an, he was a kid from out of the country. His parents were also struggled because it was a, uh, he had blown out of program after program after program, and it was like the last thing that they said, this is, this is the last thing we can do for this kid. And we just, we worked with him. We worked with him, even though everyone else around him wanted to kind of, not, not everyone, but just some people were saying, hey, it's tiring on the staff. It's hard work. And I was like, I'm not done. I can still do it. And it, it worked out. It worked out really good. I mean, it was just great. I mean, it was just powerful. But there's success story after success story after success story that we've had over at the ranch because it's just, we've had kids come in and they're violent and aggressive. And my staff are really good at taking the punches and taking the falls and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden we see this mad, this powerful shift where all of a sudden they're productive and they're ready to move on and they're going into different places. And, but it's, it's amazing how you just have to hold on and just go with it because it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be hard at the start, but it's worth it. Thank you so much for sharing those vulnerable stories and powerful. Yeah. I often tell parents, like, initially things get harder before they get easier, and you got to oh, yeah. kind of buckle up. Yes. Um, yeah. As a therapist, we know that you got to do the hard work first. Yeah. 
and kids are going to fight you and you'll get a lot of resistance and pushback, but eventually you get that kind of extinction burst. Yes. And the cool thing about kids on the spectrum is yeah. once they get it yeah. and once it clicks, yeah. they are like ingrained in it. Mm-hmm. Once they get the rules and they know what they need to do, like, man, they hold their parents accountable. Yes. They hold the staff accountable. They're like, no, 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 that's not how we do this. Yes. And they just, like you said, it just, it's like mm-hmm. a light, a switch yeah. flips on. It's amazing. And they're ingrained in it. Yeah. Once they, they grasp it and they run with it. Yes. And they're just... They have this superpower that mm-hmm. is so not recognized yeah. that I wish more people could see mm-hmm. and they could see them themselves. Yes. And I think at the ranch, you guys do an amazing job at helping these kids and these parents yeah. see that superpower yeah. and see their strengths and help them, like you said, not give up. Yeah. Because I, they've had years and years of people giving up and saying, no, we can't do this. Yeah. And I hate that. I hate when people say, oh, you just need to give up. We just need to move them on. I'm like, no, I don't see that. I just, we just need more time and we just need a little bit more patience and we can do this. I mean, he's not, there's no other place that's going to take him. And that's the sad part is usually Discovery Ranch and the things that we're doing there, that's the the last thing that, the last place that they can send him. I mean, unless it's some type of really kind of lockdown facility. I hate, because I've worked at those places. I, I worked at these lockdown facilities, I, I like them. They're they're needed and they're necessary, and that the boys that come to the ranch don't need it. But I I do also know that there are kids that are not good fits, and and that's that's the case. And I I am aware of that, and I I can I know that. But if I know that they're a good fit, and we just need to give it more time, then I will push back on on management or administration and stuff like that, and say, hey, just give me more time. Love it, Chris. It has been a delight Mm -hmm. talking with you about this um, topic that's dear to my own heart. Um, I just love your experience and expertise. I hope our listeners have found value and hope and healing um, in what you've shared. Thank you. Um, Because you really have been a beacon of light and hope for for me listening to these stories Uh because these are hard kids to work with. They are. They're tough and they're worth it. They absolutely are worth it. Great talking to you. I appreciate it. 